Hey guys, Jill here. Welcome back to Whispering Willow Farm. I'm at my greenhouse this morning. It's early and rainy, and I don't know about you, but when it is rainy in the winter time, there is nothing else I want to do than grab my seed catalogs and start rummaging. Now, I get asked a lot what seeds I'm growing for the spring, what I recommend, my must-haves, what I don't go a year without growing. That's what I'm gonna dive into today. If you guys are anything like me, you also have been getting your seed catalogs. Uh, some of the ones that I usually always order from, I typically order from the same seed companies. I do throw some different ones in uh, every now and then, which this year I ordered from two different companies that I don't typically order from in the past. And we'll kind of go over that, but Botanical Interest is one that I ordered probably majority of my plants from this year. Uh, we're kind of shifting the garden completely from anything I've ever grown before, which has been different. And I've been trying to source out the best people in the best place to buy my seeds. We're doing a lot of flowers this year. We're doing a lot of paste tomatoes. We're doing a lot of things that I've just never dabbled into. I mean, most of my flower seeds that I got ended up coming from botanical interest. Obviously, you know, the legend for heirloom seeds would be Baker Creek. I have the whole catalog here, which if you're really into like diving into more in depth on the different heirloom varieties, I recommend going ahead and buying the whole seed catalog. It tells you the story and the history and it just is really good to have honestly as a reference. Uh, some years I don't buy it, but some years I want to just kind of dive into more how the variety was grown, where it came from, uh, just the history behind it a lot more. And I found uh, that the whole seed catalog actually allows you to kind of dive in and use as a reference more and I really appreciate that. Now, of course, Johnny's, I love Johnny's. They are certified organic, so you're able to buy certified organic seeds if that's something that you're aiming to do, which is really nice. Uh, the only thing about Johnny's that I would say is the price point is probably gonna be a bit more expensive than if you sourced it out somewhere. Um, but there is a variety I grew last year from Johnny's that will go in my garden every single year from here on out. Now, there are a couple things I kinda wanna talk to you guys about. Um, I have mentioned several times I'm not the best when it comes to being just super organized like I don't have spreadsheets and and stuff like that I wish I did I wish I was that type of person but if you've been following my channel for any period of time you know I am a free spirit so sitting down in front of a computer for hours and just jotting down you know information is really difficult for me I don't thrive in those types of environments but one thing I do every year, and I would recommend you guys doing this, whether it's your first year growing a garden, whether you've grown a garden for years and years, this is probably something you've already practiced, I feel like it is good advice for anyone. And that is figure out your purpose behind the food you're growing. Now, I do add in experimental crops every single year. Uh, depending on the space I have, usually it's just two crops, sometimes three. We're all grow a different variety, but I don't want to plant half my garden in experimental crops that I've never grown before and I don't know how they're going to do, uh, especially for someone like myself who sells my produce, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So I will give a small space in my garden, but I figure out what is my purpose? Is my purpose to can tomatoes? Is my purpose to sell herbs? Is my purpose to sell flowers? Now this year, uh, I have a buyer for all of my flowers, so I am switching gears and I'm growing flowers because I know I can sell them. That's what makes sense for me. I did inventory uh, of our pantry and I realized I have a lot of diced tomatoes and stuff like that, but I'm really running out of tomato sauces, ketchups, uh, things of that nature. So last year I grew mainly just slicers. This year I'm going to be, you know, twisted and growing a lot of like Roma paste tomatoes because I checked my inventory and I saw I was low in those areas. Last year I grew a boatload of green beans. So I am loaded. So this year I may try to switch gears and grow something else since I'm stocked up on that stuff. And so I just really recommend you guys figuring out, you know, what it is that your family's needs are, whether you're wanting to keep it yourself, um, you know, sell it and then also preservation how how are you going to preserve this you know do you have 
a dehydrator for your herbs or do you have you know a freeze vacuum sealer are you wanting to press your can or just making sure you have everything you need to set yourself up for the season I remember one year I was a kind of an amateur when it came to growing and I had grown all these things that really just needed to have that long shelf life by being pressure canned and I didn't even own a pressure canner and I thought well I wish I would have like researched that a little bit more because I ended up having to go buy a pressure canner that I wasn't expecting to and that was extra cost and so I may not be the most organized when it comes to the garden it is one of those like what I'm feeling things like that but every single year I do figure out what my needs are what I'm selling and that really kind of determines a lot for me now I do have several seed packets here and I'm going to be able to actually physically show you guys uh, but I think it's really valuable too to kind of see the end product and what that looks like as far as you know your fruits and things like that. Uh, so if I mention something and I don't have a seed packet for it I'll just pop up a picture that way you guys can see. For me I like going out into my garden when I grew a lot of tomatoes and I liked it to be like a yellow, a red, a purple, a white. I like to have all that different variety and I think about those things whenever I'm planning out the garden as well aesthetically what do I like what do I not like but ultimately I just hope this video is helpful um, if you have any questions a lot of these are new varieties to me but like I said some of the main pl places I buy from I'll link them below but botanical interest is where I got majority of my seeds from this year I did order some from Hudson Valley a seed company which were new to me uh, Johnny's I typically and of course Baker Creek they're just they're kind of known uh, so let's just dive right in so I grew onions for the first time last year. I had bought the sets of onions at our co-op and put them in the ground. We bought them late. It was an afterthought. And, you know, they weren't really, really mature. I had some decent sized onions, but they weren't huge uh, by the time it was harvest time. And we use every single one of those. So I realized really quickly that onions are one of those things I need to be more diligent in thinking about, especially when planting the garden, uh, because we use it all the time. Garlic. I plant garlic every year. We use garlic every single day. Uh, so these came from MI Gardener. And they are the Texas Early Rondo. Uh, we prefer just these like sweet yellow onions. Uh, this is a short day, uh, so that is also important to know. And then I've got this one from Baker Creek. I'm not even going to attempt to butcher the name. So these are the two onions that I'm going to start from seeds and then transplant out. Sorry if it's loud. We are getting like a downpouring of rain. Um, so, sorry you guys. So the first thing I want to talk to you guys about, because this is primarily in the past what I've grown in my garden, and that would be tomatoes. Now last year I grew in a high tunnel. If you guys have, you know, watched vlogs from the summer, I partnered with a local farm and grew in their high tunnel for the summer. I no longer do that anymore, but it was a really good experience. And I grew the Grand Marshall. Uh, it is a determinate variety, so I weaved it like the Florida weave. You didn't really have uh, all the trellising to think about. And it was probably one of the most prolific tomatoes I've ever grown. I had never grown a determinate tomato before. Now I know a lot of you guys that's all you grow because I've kind of gotten told a lot why do you only grow indeterminate? What's the point in that? And it's just all I've ever known. Most of the varieties that I chose were just indeterminate. It wasn't like I preferred one over the other. But what I had found is I really prefer the determinate varieties. Uh, I love that they didn't get huge and I didn't have to worry about this big elaborate trellising system and you know like it was just really really nice they looked like an apple and that was the best way I could describe it. I had absolutely zero splitting. They were the most uniform fruit I have ever sold. Uh, I got good money from them because they were just literally perfect. I would make jokes all the time that I would go out into the tunnel and I would just harvest a basket full of apples. It was so bizarre. So if you were looking for just a tried and true, it was really meaty but it tasted well. Um, you're looking for something to sell. You could even use that to make uh, your sauces and stuff like that as well. So it wasn't, it was considered a slicer. However, it wasn't like your typical beef steak or what may come to mind when you think like a brandy wine, when you may think of a slicer. It had so much substance and meat to it that I have no doubt I could have pureed it down and made it into a sauce just fine. But that is one of those, I will never 
not have that in my garden. I was so completely blown away. I It had come recommended to me by several other farmers in our area, and I honestly just cannot say enough things about it. Like, Johnny knocked it out of the park with this one. Um, it was one of it was one of the only things I'd actually ordered from Johnny's this year uh, for the spring garden in 2021. But it was such a good one that I definitely recommend you guys. If you just saw by the pictures that I put up, it was just, it was one to compete with for sure. Although I'm not going to be growing all of these varieties that I am about to tell you guys in my garden this year due to space, these are ones that I've grown for probably the last four years. Tried and true. Absolutely love them. Uh, typically would not have a garden season without them. And I may, once I plant everything, can figure out, okay, let me throw these in. Uh, these were just so, so good. And that is the Granny Cantrell. It is a beautiful red slicer, as you guys can see. Uh, super, super meaty. It didn't really have a lot of cracking. I just had to be diligent on when I would go and harvest it. But it was one of those that produced really, really well. I ended up even having well over, several well over two pound fruits from this. Uh, so when I think of a prolific slicer, uh, Granny Cantrell is usually one I always try to recommend to people. Last year was the first year that I grew this and it is the Kellogg's Breakfast. It's very similar to the Dr. Witchy. I did find that it didn't produce as much as my Dr. Witchy's in years past. However, the flavor was a bit sweeter to me. So I don't personally like uh, real acidic tomatoes. That's something that kind of turns me away. I'm not one of those that I'm just gonna go, you know, slice a tomato and just start chomping down. I'll eat it with things, I eat it in things. But this was one of those that I found myself kind of eating with some cucumbers and some homemade ranch and I ended up just really liking it. I wouldn't say that it was super prolific for me um, but I've heard different from other people so it could just be the area that I'm in but I definitely think the taste alone if you've got the extra space in your garden uh, the taste was really really nice and I, I would I would still recommend it just based off of that. This was also one I just grew last year. This is the Berkey tie-dye pink. I love this. As you guys can see, it reminds me of the pink boar, which we'll go over with in a second. It was beautiful. When you cut into it, it had the most beautiful red and green streaks. It produced, it definitely did not produce the biggest fruit. Uh, they were very, probably just medium size. So for me, I don't think that I would call it a slicer just because the slicers I'm used to getting are relatively big, uh, but it was beautiful. It produced a lot. This was one of Nathan's favorite. It tasted really, really well. I went back and forth on if I should even plant it or not, but I had a lot of people just recommend it, and they're like, yeah, that's one you should definitely add in, and I'm glad I did. I'm moving forward. I will be planting this again. It will not make the cut for this year's garden. Uh, however, I really, really liked it, and especially when you're thinking, uh, for me, like I said, I like to have those beautiful uh, tomatoes in the garden. This is one of those that when I would go and harvest it, it just really brought me a lot of joy. So if you guys will notice, a lot of the things that I am sh telling you guys, showing you uh, varieties from Europe's past, they're definitely not your most acidic ones, and that is just because that is what I prefer. I prefer, you know, the fruity over acidic. Nathan actually does as well. Like, he likes your traditional tomato, but a lot of the ones that I'm showing you are yellows and oranges, and that is just simply because of preference. I know there are really good tomatoes out there. Uh, this is just simply my must-haves, my recommendation. I do know that there are a lot of other really good videos out there of other people uh, offering their perspective on some other things, uh, but I just wanted to let you guys know there's so many great varieties out there, and I really encourage you guys add in those few new varieties each year. That way you guys can come up with your own kind of resources and your own recommendation to kind of help someone else. Um, I know that there are people out there though like me that don't enjoy acidic tomatoes. They enjoy those fruity sweet ones. Um, and so I'm hoping that this is still helpful across the board. This is the uh, hillbilly potato leaf. It's very interesting. So it gets its name because the leaves are not a traditional tomato leaf. They grow that of a potato. It is very bizarre. I had a lot of cracking with this one this year. Now we did have a lot of rain and I was also juggling growing in a high tunnel and growing in our, our house. So I feel like that could have potentially just been from neglect on my end, uh, not harvesting them in enough time. I do recommend with all of these 
if you're just wanting to go outside and harvest a tomato to eat fresh, obviously wait until it's at its peak. However, if you're wanting these to can or preserve or whatever it is you plan on doing with them, freezing them for later, I recommend harvesting them at the first sign of blush and then letting them ripen inside. I found that that helps a lot. It also kind of prevents waiting too late until they crack because of rain or sun scald or something like that. I've just found that for me, it kind of helps when I go out there and I'm seeing that it's starting to get color just to pull them and let them ripe on the counter. Granted, I'm not one of those, like I said, that likes to go out there and just eat them. So if that is you, I would definitely leave them and wait until they're at their peak. That way they taste the best. Um, but this was a very, very meaty, also one of those really, really beautiful tomatoes. It had red and orange and yellow streaking, and it was just great. It produced a lot. Most of mine were, you know, a pound and a half, two pound tomatoes, and that's been the case for me for the last several years. Uh, this year, though, I had a lot of bad aphids just on this plant in particular. Uh, and I don't know if that was because of the potato leaf. It was just different. I don't know, but it was very obvious that this plant was dealing with aphids it was almost became like my trap plant by the end of the season I had given up on it doing anything the aphids had just overtaken them no matter how many times I'd sprayed for neem oil or did organic uh, treatments on it so I say it's worth giving it a try because that could have just been like issues I was having with it but in years past this has been one of those that I absolutely loved really prolific really large big slicers if you uh, harvest them early enough I say that you're probably good I wouldn't wait and let it ripen too much on the vine though Alright, now we have a pink slicer. This is one of the only pink slicers I've grown. It is German pink. It is super, super meaty. The starts that I, because I start these from seed, obviously, the starts were just strong. They were one of my strongest competitors uh, last year when I grew them. They just thrived. They were just like everything I could have hoped for uh, in a start by the time I transplant them out into my garden. Uh, they just did really good. They are beautiful, as you guys can see. Like, you can tell they're pink, but they are just that meaty, dark, um, great, wonderful flavor, super prolific. Yielded several one, two pound tomatoes. And for me, when I'm canning those and stuff, like that's really good. Also, when I'm trying to sell these, they want a tomato that is a big slicer. So for me, I definitely enjoyed the German pink. German Johnson Red. I did not grow this last year. However, I grew it the year before. I would just, it's very flavorful. It did not have any cracks. It wasn't the largest fruit. However, it was a very consistent tomato. I could go out there and I knew I would have several on there that were in really good condition, that tasted really good, and was just everything you could want for uh, out of a slicer. Now around here where I'm from, Cherokee Purple is a known tomato. Uh, any farmer around here primarily grows Cher Cherokee Purple. If you have a tomato like that with those black hues and you're selling it to someone, that's what comes to mind. Last year I grew Cherokee Purple for the first time and I was so disappointed. Um, I don't enjoy them. I don't understand what all of, you know, the fame uh, revolved around the Cherokee Purple is, especially in my area. I've just always kind of scratched my head on that and thought, there has to be a better substitute to the Cherokee purple because for me I'm coming at this as I need to be able to offer um, you know the people buying from me something different than they just can't find from the farmer down the road which happened to be Cherokee purple so that is when I found black from Tula now this is not for me they were not ever huge um, they're about 8 to 12 ounces was pretty typical. Uh, they had beautiful dark hues. The inside was very dark just like you would have gotten out of a Cherokee purple. Had a very smoky taste. I loved this tomato. It happened to be one of my best sellers. Uh, so if you're looking for something, maybe you are selling and you're in a similar situation where everyone offers that, you know, Cherokee purple tomato and that's just the one that kind of comes to mind. I definitely look into growing uh, the black from Tula because it just did really, really good. Super rich, super smoky, excellent flavor. Definitely one that will always go on my list. 
So those are the ones that I've grown in the past. The ones, I've, and I've grown more than that. These are just the ones that I would recommend to somebody else wanting to grow them. These are all new varieties to me. A mortgage Lifter came recommended. I believe Jess grew this and told me that it was really well. It is a slicer. Uh, I don't really know much about it. I haven't done a lot of research. Um, but this will be the things I'm growing for to can. So my paste tomatoes. I have got a pink ox heart. Now these came from seeds now. I'll put up a photo so you guys can see. These aren't that great. These are really meaty. These are going to be really good for making those sauces. Uh, I've grown ox hearts once probably four or five years ago and I don't even remember enough that was before I took detailed notes in my garden but I know that anyone I know that grows paste tomatoes this is what they tell me to do they tell me to grow a, an ox heart so that is exactly what I did uh, this is a tomato pole as you guys can see it kind of looks different it's got some ribbings this is supposed to be pretty sweet uh, so this will be one that probably will add into like the kids ketchup when I make it and stuff like that and I'm just I'm curious I'm excited to try the paste tomatoes I know it's gonna be a different scene because I'm used to growing these large slicers that is primarily what I have had in my garden for the last few years uh, I haven't even really grown anything uh, you know or continued to grow it unless it yielded those large fruits and so knowing that that's gonna be totally different this year like you know your Roma tomatoes and your paste tomatoes they just don't get that big they're not intended to I know that that's going to be different for me to go out into the garden but I think once I can you know channel in my head while I'm using these I think it will still uh, I think it'll be encouraging honestly just to have something different in the garden and kind of have that anticipation of I wonder how these are going to do I wonder what this is going to taste like now even though I don't love eating tomatoes raw I do taste every tomato I grow because I do want to give you guys an honest opinion on how I think it is. Uh, this is a San Marzano uh, Pole Roma. They look really, really beautiful. Um, this is supposed to be the mother of all paste tomatoes. So I'm going to see uh, if she holds up to her name or not. I've got the Ace 55. So this is a bush. This is supposed to be not very acidic at all which is what I was kind of thinking of when I was picking some of these ones that would still produce well but would be low in acidity. So I'm curious on how these will do. Uh, this is a determinate variety as well too. So most of them are, these two were indeterminates, but when it says that bush here, I don't know if you guys can see that. When it says bush, that's what it is meaning that this is, and it will usually say it. Uh, so it says on the front of the seed packet too over here that it is a determinant. But that is something to keep in mind when you are buying uh, tomato plants and stuff. If you're only wanting determinant or indeterminate, just make sure that you're reading that uh, in the description on the website or in the seed catalog or, you know, something like that. Because it will, I wouldn't want to put this by all my determinants if I was going to trellis them up all a certain way. It would just kind of throw everything off. So let's move in to cherry tomatoes, which happen to be my favorite. I can eat cherry tomatoes all day long um, because cherry tomatoes some of them taste like candy and I actually really enjoy that my children enjoy it they sell really really well now I know cherry tomatoes it's hard to put up cherry tomatoes so it is one of those things that we do grow just for like snacking for us uh, for the kids I do sell some but cherry tomatoes it is kind of hard when you're thinking about how many cherry tomatoes you'd have to have to be able to preserve that honestly it's probably just not worth it um, but these are some of the best ones that I have ever grown as far as just good tasting make you immediately like Remember that moment in the summertime when you're in the dreaded winter cherry tomatoes. Those will do it for you all day long. Now we have the pink boar. This is a wild boar farms variety. They're extremely juicy, beautiful. When you cut into them, I kind of immediately think of like a watermelon, like just all those different colors and textures. It's really, really great. It's, it's larger than a cherry, uh, but it wouldn't. it's not even considered like a medium size, but the flavor is amazing. Uh, Wild Boar Farms has come out with some really, really cool varieties. There's only a few of them that I've actually uh, grown and had the experience of growing, but I have been told so many wonderful things. So if you're looking for some good, different uh, crossed varieties, Wild Boar Farms, I'll actually link them below so you guys can go check them out. But this is one that we really, really enjoyed. So that would be the blueberry. So there's blueberries, there is blue cream berries, um, these are just great. They have these uh, really, really great flavors. 
they're really sweet it's like you're tasting candy now the blueberries I had no cracking no splitting uh, they were just so prolific and the blue cream berries also really beautiful these are ones that I sell a lot uh, at the plant uh, sale whenever I'm starting tomatoes cherry tomatoes for the plant sale these are ones that I think about because it's easy for me to you know describe to them what they look like uh, just give some pointers on them I've grown these for years and years and I will always anytime I've tried to add in a new a cherry tomato variety I'm always finding myself comparing me comparing them uh, to these because they're just so good that I can just can't imagine not growing these in my garden uh, tomato red fig is actually really cool uh, it's very very sweet these were actually used to make preserves um, and jams that's how sweet they were I did have issues with them splitting uh, they'd split right at the very top right here and that could have just been um, because I didn't pick them in time however they they were like really I'd have to harvest them really really underripe to prevent the splitting however the taste was amazing they didn't produce a ton um, but the flavor was really cool and I thought it would also be kind of cool to experiment and make preserves and jam out of a tomato like that just seems wild to me we'd even tossed around the idea of doing a tomato flavored kombucha and this was one that was going to be uh, the tomato that I tried that with Brad's Atomic Grape, many of you guys probably know this. It is an oblong, beautiful, one of Nathan's favorite uh, cherry tomatoes. It is hardy, have hardly any cracking issue. It's really, really hard skin. Um, just the flavor, it's one of those that sometimes you grow food and you have an experience and this is one of those tomatoes that every time I grow it Nathan has an experience with this tomato it is so good I've never tasted anything like it and honestly he hasn't either it's just one of those that is like wow that will kind of like blow your socks off like it is a really stinking good variety um, so that's one of those that I always recommend if you have not tried it try it you will not be disappointed then we have the Berries Crazy Cherry. So these grow in clusters. Um, these are really, they have a really thin wall so they do kind of split often. You can harvest them at several different stages too. As you can see on here, there's greens and there's yellows. I've noticed the more yellow that they are, the sweeter that they are. And the more, less yellow obviously. Uh, they're tart but I prefer when like they're yellow yellow uh, because even when they're blushing yellow like a lot of times I would say just harvest early let them ripe on the counter for these I found that really doesn't the taste just does drastically change now I didn't grow these last year not because I didn't want to this is the most prolific plant I've ever grown in my entire life I would go out there in my garden and harvest five gallon buckets at a time. I have never had a plant do what the Berry's Crazy Cherry has done. I would just be clipping off clusters and clusters and I wouldn't even make a dent in the plant. It grows really bushy and it overtook a lot. So I did not give it near enough space as it needed. I also was just not prepared for how productive that this would be which is why I've not grown it. That's why I didn't grow it last year because I just didn't feel like I had the space for it and I didn't have a buyer for it last year either. Um, if you're looking for a really prolific, really sweet, this is one of those when people came over I'd give to them to try um, and they really just enjoyed the taste of it. But let me tell you, if you're looking for something that's gonna produce well, this will be it all day long. Uh, so now I just want to kind of shift. I, I knew I wanted to cover tomatoes with you guys because I get asked about tomatoes a lot. Um, another thing I kind of get asked about a lot, and I'm just going to be really honest with you guys, is that's what peppers I have grown. I have not successfully grown peppers for as long as I've been a gardener. I've bought all of my peppers that have been in my garden in years past from other farmers. And, uh, this year I did buy shishito peppers um, because my friend Jess grows a lot of these and I got a lot from her this year and it was really really tasty when we were just blistering them with some olive oil and the cast iron skillet we just enjoyed eating that um, so I'm going to attempt to grow these however I have invested a lot of money in all these different pepper varieties and I just know that that's something I don't grow well uh, Nathan doesn't really like hot peppers I make some pepperoncinis but it's just we don't utilize the peppers near enough for me to just 
justify growing a ton, especially when I just don't grow them well. So peppers are one of those things. I'm determined to grow some shishitos this year, but it's one of those crops that I've kind of just forfeited, so I don't feel like I have a well enough opinion to say this one's great, this one's not, because I don't eat a lot of peppers. I haven't tried enough, I haven't grown enough. Uh, so that's one of those. I can obviously recommend the shishito because I've grown it before and I think it's amazing. Now for the sake of this video not being 45 minutes long because I can totally nerd out when it comes to growing, uh, starting seeds and everything I'm planting. So I'm just going to kind of make these last few things quick. I did mention that I'm not growing near as many beans as I have in the past because I have plenty of beans put up. Uh, some of the new ones that I am growing this year though are lima beans and fava beans and these will probably be the only two I'll do this style of bean. Um, another thing that we are doing though is a lot of different squash. Now not your traditional crook neck, straight neck squash and you're just, you know, black beauty zucchini. Uh, we have a lot of pest damage when it comes to that. So we're going to be doing a lot of butternut squashes. These are things that we buy in the grocery store a lot. Honey nut squash, spaghetti squash, things that I can put up just that I can preserve like the entire uh, squash, put it on racks and have it throughout the winter uh, to grab from. So that is new to us. I will not be growing any traditional just squash and zucchini because it's simply not worth it. The squash bugs that we have here, I would just get a couple harvest off of it and it's really not worth my time and my energy. And then once the squash bugs have come into the garden, they will forever be in the garden. Now we will still do tromboncino squash because we eat that every single year. That is one of those. It's that long squash. I'll put a picture of it up. Very, very prolific. Stores really well. Tastes well raw or sauteed or cooked up. Uh, just super, super versatile. Other than that, I will still be doing my radishes and my beets and my turnips and my lettuce and kales and things like that. Um, but those are kind of just like, I feel like your preference as far as what you're wanting. Um, I'm going to be diving into our flowers next and explain to you my choices behind that, um, why I chose to do these, and I'm just really excited. So as you guys know, flowers are new to me. I've always grown sunflowers. Uh, last year I had this really cool cross that ended up happening. I grew a mammoth multi-headed sunflower. I saved seeds from that. I'll post a picture. It was so cool. I mean, this thing was huge. It was just so cool that I had that cross happen in my garden. I was able to save the seeds from it. I cannot wait to see uh, what it is next year. I also have this vanilla ice and then I have the Pro Cut Sunflowers from Haas Tools all grow. We don't sell these. I just like having these around for the pollinator friends. I usually stick them in the end of the beds. Um, it's just really fun to have these. It just adds pop of color in your garden. Um, I grew zinnias last year. I found out that I don't know how to space flowers well at all. So I realized that I could have put a lot more zinnias in the garden than I did. I just don't know anything. And this has been a complete and total learning curve. And I encourage you guys, if you're wanting to grow something in your garden you never have before, don't be intimidated because you don't know. Because I don't know the first thing about flowers. But it has challenged me to research and dive deeper and study more and learn something I didn't know, which I think is really valuable. Now, I know a little something about flowers and I can teach you guys, um, maybe not right now because I haven't successfully grown them, but eventually I'm gonna be able to show you guys and tell you what I did wrong and how I learned through the process. And maybe that's not flowers for you. Maybe that's tomatoes or maybe that's peppers or squash or fill in the blank. But I encourage you to try new things and experiment with things that you're not comfortable with just to expand your knowledge because I really do think that knowledge is the greatest tool we have. And if we're able to learn and adapt and teach someone else, then it's, it's obviously worth it. Now, I grew zinnias in my garden last year. The pollinators loved them. We had butterflies every time I went out to the garden. The bees absolutely loved them. They brought my heart so much joy. Uh, I also have talked to a local farmer that I'm going to be selling these to. She let me know uh, what varieties other farmers were providing her and so I just kind of filled in the gap and they are really really beautiful. All of these are new. I've never grown any of these. These are the Northern Lights blend. Um, lots of just different beautiful colors there. I have the Giant Purple. I think this is the one that I am most excited about. These are just absolutely beautiful. I've got another Giant blend with lots of beautiful colors here. Cactus flowers. As you can see this is not your traditional zinnia. Um, it's got really different texture. I'm excited to grow these because I think it's going to be unique and different 
California Giants. These are ones that I actually grew last year. Um, I think for me, flowers, the biggest thing is figuring out when to cut them. Uh, that way they have the biggest shelf life and selling them. Look at this. This is envy. These are completely green. How cool are those? I don't know. I just thought I kind of got carried away. Uh, the peppermint stick I have heard wonderful things from. Look at that, you guys. These are, they're just fun. I think like when you think about making your garden profitable or what you're going to grow to preserve, it kind of gets overwhelming. And when I think about growing flowers, I think about this is fun. Like, I think I needed this this year. Like, this year has just kind of been a crazy year for all of us. And I needed to plan out my garden and know that I'm going to walk through there and I'm just going to have a lot of really happy moments. And I hope you guys do that too. If it's just growing one flower plant or one herb that you wanted to grow, whatever it is, you know, that when you walk through your garden, it's going to spark that joy. It's going to spark that, oh, this is worth all the long days spent out here. I pray you guys find that. I know that these are going to bring me a lot of joy uh, on the really long days that I'm out in the garden working. Uh, this is a fireball blend. Lots of oranges and reds. Just beautiful, beautiful tones. Primarily zinnias are what I'm growing to sell. I'm real excited because I've grown these before, so I know uh, what they do. I'm trying to figure out the right time, like I said, to cut them and things like that. But overall, that's not going to be completely foreign. The varieties will be new, but that doesn't determine, you know, anything different as far as how they're grown. Now, the rest of these are completely new. These are dahlias, and they are a sister to the zinnia. Uh, typically, you buy these in tubers. I I, by the time I tried to buy these in tubers, they were completely sewed out. I was late to the game. So I am trying to grow these from seeds. I don't know enough to know what the difference of that is. But I know that they are a beautiful, beautiful uh, sister of the zinnia. We have carnation. This is one of those that the petals just take your breath away. Can you guys see just how magnificent that is? Uh, I just, this is just making me, it's just making me so happy bachelor buttons i've just got uh, this is your black magic and then i did burgundy beauties i just thought for filling in a bouquet uh, these would be a nice little pop of color there we go these are relatively really easy to uh, the farmer that i'm selling to she recommended that i grow some of these she just said they were really easy she would buy a lot as fillers so that was kind of what you know stemmed that uh, this is going just as a companion plant. Uh, so I grow marigolds every year, just your French marigolds, in between all of my tomato plants as a companion. And I, I just found that it works really well for me. Um, and then this year I saw these African, they're white marigolds, and they really stuck out to me. And so I grabbed some of those. Also when I was farm sitting for Jessamaya back in the summer, I was going through a garden and she had all these yellow marigolds that were beautiful. And they were starting to dry up, so I grabbed a few pods and I'm going to grow those. So I think these will be fun. Instead of just your traditional yellow that I'm used to seeing, I thought, well, let's just spice it up and let's add some yellows and some whites. And so I think that the garden's just going to be extremely beautiful uh, this year. And then I have the Celosia. You guys, these are magic. Look, they look like little pom-poms. I think they're just so cool. This is the Chief Red Flame. These are also really good for bouquets. So again, not my knowledge, just going off what has been recommended to me. I will be glad to do another review on some of these flowers once I've grown them and can give you my honest opinion in this Arkansas humidity and heat, uh, how they do. I was just taking the recommendation of someone else. So these are these new ones that I can't speak for how they do, but I'm excited to kind of give you guys an overview after the end of the summer. Um, I will be taking very, very detailed notes on this. Also, I'm just going to be mindful that if they flop and they don't do well. Well, I'm not going to waste my time on that next year. I'll just go back to growing vegetables. Uh, this was something, this is going to be the last thing I show you guys. I was so excited. when I, Like I said, the, the process behind planting the garden and figuring out what I'm planting really just goes, you know, food storage, what we have, what we're needing. We eat a lot of quinoa. A lot. We actually buy it 25 pounds at a time and have it shipped to our house. We eat it several times a week. And when I had mentioned to Nathan about growing my own quinoa, we don't really need it because we have some. You know, we have a ton. I thought it would be one of those really cool experimental crops. And that is one of the uh, two to three new varieties. I said I was growing uh, just for experimental reasons. This is that. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but this is how quinoa uh, is grown. And then you will essentially just kind of take those in your hands and rub them and then that's that where the actual quinoa comes out. I got 
like the one that was the rainbow because I can't help myself. <laughs> so this is the brightest, uh, brilliant rainbow color. It just looks beautiful and I cannot wait to try this. This is one of those, probably the most excited thing I'm looking forward to growing in the garden this year. Now I know this was a long video, so if you bared with me for this long, thank you. <laughs> y'all are so sweet to me i just get asked lots of messages comments on here a messages sent through on instagram what are your must-haves now i know that this was not a super super pulling out all the stops telling you everything i've ever grown i just know i grow a lot of tomatoes i get asked about that a lot a lot of you guys are asking what flowers i'm growing this year and i just wanted to share that with you guys i hope this was helpful i really just recommend you guys getting in your seed catalogs reading figuring out what's going to work best for your zone what your vision for your garden is what's your purpose also asking other farmers and growers in your area what they have had good experience with and bad experience with I think it's the best thing because I can tell you these things but I'm growing in Arkansas zone 7b so how these do for me may be totally different if you're in a completely different growing zone with completely different climate and elements coming at you so I do recommend this is a good time to kind of get connected with your local community ask around maybe you're at, maybe if you're at the farmers market you know asking someone hey what's your favorite tomato to grow what's your favorite pepper to grow what do you have success with where do you buy your seeds from i find that it's a really good conversation starter to kind of get connected to your community but also get real genuine honest feedback from the people that are your growing neighbors uh, i hope this video was helpful for you guys i hope you guys enjoyed it and that it gave you a good kind of overview of what i'm planting for spring my recommendations for you guys but thank you so much for hanging out with me today i'll talk to you soon